It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. We are continuing our coverage from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Now, here in Washington this weekend, uh, APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, is holding its annual policy conference. But here at the National Press Club, just ahead of that gathering, there is a counter event going on. It's called the Israel Lobby and American Policy. And joining us now to discuss the role of the Israel Lobby uh, and its influence at the United Nations is Ian Williams. He is a veteran UN correspondent and the author of the book Untold, The Real Story of the United Nations in Peace and War. Ian, hello. Hello. Let's talk about the UN. You've covered the UN for years. Uh, a common complaint from Israel and its supporters is that the UN is biased against Israel. Is there validity to that? Um, you know, it's the way you look at it. If you keep breaking the law and you keep appearing in the dock, you might think the police are biased against you. Other people will say, stop stealing. <laughs> And you won't end up in court so often. But the common refrain is that you know, other countries commit way worse human rights violations, but yet they, Israel is singled out for scrutiny. Yeah, I'm, you know, I think that's a very unethical excuse. The what about excuse, I call it. Every, every country in the world uses that. What about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? You know, I only beat my wife. I don't dismember her. What about so-and-so? I mean, it's... It, it, on, on its own ethicals, it does not stand up to scrutiny. However, in this particular case, they have a, the, the Israelis do have a point in that there are far, far too many um, countries, you know, uh, Iraq in the old days uh, and Iran now and the Saudis, who do indeed use uh, a farrago of complaints against, uh, a barrage of complaints against Israel to deflect from their own sins. But, you know, I mean, Israel has got a lot to be in the dock for. I mean, they're occupying territories in defiance of international resolutions. They are mistreating the Palestinians under occupation. They have raided their neighbors frequently and dropped bombs on them. And they have, you know, they invaded Gaza, killed thousands of people, they're besieging it. There is a lot for Israel to be held account for. And yes, by all means, we should go after the others as well. But that doesn't mean to say, you know, you, you really do not get you don't get up in the court when you're on trial and say, what about so-and-so I saw robbing a bank last week? You know, if you were seen robbing a bank, that's what the issue that's uh, in front of the court or in front of the United Nations. And, you know, Israel has been called bang to rights on almost all of these issues. But now it's actually running for a seat on the Security Council. Do you think they'll get it? Very much doubt it. I mean, it's extremely unpopular. Uh, the, way they, the only way they can get it, I, they're, they're running against Germany and Belgium for the West European and other group seat. And uh, the West European group is unique because it actually has elections instead of doing things on a backroom, cozy rotor deal. Um, elections to become the nominee to, uh, on the council. Yeah, yeah, to become the temporary member. So uh, the only way they can get it is if they persuade Germany to stand down. And I strongly think they're going to go, they're going to try, they're going to say to Germany, you owe us big style, you know, 1945 and onwards, this is your big piece of reparations you've got to pay us. And the Germans are going to say, no, no, take another submarine and shut up. We're not dropping out. And Germany, is, you can't accuse Germany of not paying reparations to, to Israel over it's, the years. Yes, uh, it's, it's um, paying over through the, through the nose, yeah. including corrupt deals on submarines. <laughs> how, speaking of corrupt, how corrupt is that process uh, by which countries cajole to get on a seat on the council? Is there a lot of, is there bribery involved? How much mm, sort of backroom dealing not is much there? I, there's, there's a lot of cajoling. There's a lot. But generally speaking, the worst bit about it is it's a rotor base. So you get completely unsuitable countries. Like Rwanda had a seat on the Security Council at the time of the, uh, of the genocide there. You know, uh, Morocco is, was on all the time uh, while it was occupying Western Sahara. Indonesia was on there all the time while it was occupying East Timor. One can argue that almost no country has the right to uh, sit on the, on the council. <laughs> yes, but ethically speaking, exactly. very few. Yeah. I, think, I think we'd have to pick on sort of somewhere like Ireland and Jamaica, but right. they, they do not meet the qualifications for a permanent member. <laughs> well, let me ask you about another UN member, uh, going back to uh, the issue of Palestine, which is that, so in recent years, Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, have increased their presence there uh, as a bid to pressure Israel to comply with international law. And they've used some of the avenues available to them to join the UN, seeking UN recognition, mm -hmm. joining forums like UNESCO. And because of that, they've gotten a really harsh response from Israel and the US. So can you talk about the steps that Palestinians have taken to um, integrate itself further into the UN body 
and the retaliation that they've gotten in response? Well, it was over 20 years ago. In fact, it was uh, Yasser Arafat's nephew, who was the representative of the UN uh, under him, Nasser al qidwa They began what I called the resolutionary road to liberation. And they basically assessed the Palestinian. They realized that liberation struggle was a dead end because uh, they would lose. <laughs> uh, and so what they did was to restate the legality of the Palestinian position. So they got all of these resolutions, they dusted them off, and they reiterated them so they couldn't be accused of, you know, going fallow on the shelf. They restated these positions and they refined them. And it annoyed the Israelis to hell because all the, the Israelis are people of law. Okay, they twist the law, they defy the law, they reinterpret the law, they say the law doesn't mean what you say it but does. But they claim to follow it. They claim to follow, and it, it's deep in the national psyche, I think. That, that, uh, it's part of their brand. Abiding. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's Talmudic scholars. They're very Talmudic about it in the sense of, you know, rabbinical sages will tell you, no, you can't switch the light on, but if you wink at somebody and they switch it on for you, that's okay. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no if, if, if you belong to a tradition where, in a sense, you're trying to cheat God, then cheating the UN is no big deal. <laughs> right, right. So, and um, or at least, you know, play a blinder on God. <laughs> um, so that, that tradition works and they're, they're, to a large extent that they basically just say yes yes we, we we respect the law but we don't believe it says what you say it does you know so uh, who are you going to believe me or the other 193 countries <laughs> so the, the, the Palestinians wanted to restate this they have restated it and it annoys the hell out of the Israelis and the recognition as a state that gets extra stuff now because the noose is tightening uh, with a sense of global um, global legality and law there are Israeli generals and politicians now who have to check, like Henry Kissinger, with their lawyers as well as their travel agents before they go anywhere. Right. I mean, there was, there was an Israeli politician who was, who was kept on the plane at Heathrow because they were tipped off there was an international arrest warrant waiting for him if he got off the plane. Right. And Tippi Libni, I think, the former foreign minister, she even canceled the trip yeah. uh, as a result of uh, trying to avoid potential charges. Yeah, and once, once Palestine becomes a state, then crimes committed on its territory come under the purview of the International Criminal Court. It raises the ramp even further. The stuff in, uh, the stuff in London is universal jurisdiction, where you know, it, it's, a, it, it's, the same, it's the same rap they got Pinochet on uh, for a while before letting him go. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole new departure in international law, which in general is good, I mean, you know, because we don't think people should have impunity. And obviously, you know, if, if you think everything you do is good and what everything other people do is immoral, then you take a different view on it, but in general, hey, this is, this is what Nuremberg was about, you know? The, the fact that these were German generals who were accused of killing Germans, <laughs> it was a universal crime that was committed. And, and, and they were rightly held to a task by the whole international community for it. And that, that's, that's, that's what the UN is about, and that's one of the reasons why Israel is so worried about this uh, resolutionary legal road to, um, to liberation. And they, it's their big incentive to stitch up between the boycott and uh, the you know the, the boycott and sanctions and the legal stuff. I think that that's that's where the real squeeze is coming. Which is what happened with South Africa. Remember, you know it was, just, it, was the, 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 it was the boycott of South Africa, the economic sanction and the cultural boycott, which really sapped the will of the white South Africans to to, to allow the apartheid regime to continue. All true, but also critically, it was also the U.S. government deciding after years of propping up apartheid to drop its support, which seems like a long way off when it, when it comes that's, to Israel. That's the key part, yes. I mean, look, if we want Middle East peace, then the President of the United States has to call Benjamin Netanyahu or his successor and say, you don't pull out, the checks stop coming. Forthwith. Go, go fight your next election on that program and tell them that you've... Uh, teed off your, 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 your biggest donor. And Netanyahu is going to lose the election. At the moment, the Israeli electorate have nothing to lose. The, 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 you know, Netanyahu can do anything, no matter how atrocious, and get away with it. So, yeah, of course, you know, let's keep it. Sure, why should we give it back to them? You know, <laughs> there's no downside for them. If the only possible downside, short of, you know, thermonuclear war, which none of us particularly want, is... Uh, the U.S. saying, we're stopping the checks or we're stopping the diplomatic support. And that's what Obama very belatedly tried to do. If he'd done that at the beginning of his eight years, 
put in the resolution, it might have made a difference, but then it, I don't think he'd have served a second, he mightn't have served a second term. Exactly. The key, the key point is that he did it in literally his, uh, his final month in office, or his final two months in office in December 2016. Clinton did the same, by the way. He signed on for the International Criminal Court just before he left the office. Right, and Clinton also tried to <laughs> push through a, a peace process with... I don't know, just a few yeah. months left in his... Uh, no, you, you, you have to do these things at the beginning. And I, I, I honestly think, I mean, politicians are inherently cowardly. And if they, if they started a term of office with this and followed up for the duration, I think the public would reward them. I think the world would reward them. You know, the adulation would come through. And, you know, the, the, one of the points about lobbies, both the NRA or APAC, the Israel lobby, is they're not actually very popular with voters. Lobby is distilled essence of political power. It's not about votes. It's about campaign contributions. It's about rallying, you know, media opinion, uh, about rallying, uh, about getting people speaking up and for you. And this is why, you know, despite public support for gun control, the NRA keeps winning and stopping it. The public want it, NRA doesn't. And no congressman is prepared to risk their seat and their salary and their free car park at National Airport by defying them. The same with APAC, with, with you know, even more so, is that it, it has a ferocious reputation, which is not always entirely justified, by the way. There are people who have defied the Israel lobby and survived because um, in the end, I mean, when, when they made threatening noises about Senator Bob Dole uh, over, his, over his support for the refusal to pay mortgage guarantees. And uh, if, if you remember, that the, oh, the government, Shamir, was it, came... Back with the settlements when... when yes, when they, under they, the they, first they Bush, wanted they mortgage tried to hold up yeah. the, the uh, loan guarantees for the settlements. They they froze those in response to, uh, to, to Israeli settlement building. Yeah, they said, we're not going to give you money. We, we want guarantees that you're not going to build any settlements if we give you money to resettle Russian Jews. And, uh, for a bit, for a bit. But they, they caved. No, Clinton, the, Clinton caved. He, yeah. put, he put so much yeah. small print yeah. in it. But, but Bob Dole stood up against them. Well, and forever, APAC did not try to unseat him because if he'd, have got up in, well, if he'd have got up in the Midwest and said, I am running for president and these people are stopping me because they wanted me to give $10 billion to a foreign country on the other side of the Mediterranean, He'd have got him with an increased majority. Right, that's true. If he had the courage to actually say that. But then you have people like Donna Edwards of Maryland, you know, who expressed minimal support for Palestinian rights. APAC came out strongly against her, and she ultimately lost her seat. Uh, we have to leave it there. Ian Williams, veteran UN correspondent, author of Untold, The Real Story of the United Nations in Peace and War. Ian, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.